Welcome to week four of Advanced Econometrics. This week we are talking about the Logit model. So last week we talked about the random utility model and this week the Logit model is gonna be one of the first uh, kind of more specific econometric models built on that random utility model. The first one that we're gonna look at, we'll look at a few more throughout the semester. So the plan for today, we got a lot on tap, but each one of these topics is gonna to be a little smaller than the topics have been in the, or a little shorter than the topics have been in the last, uh, uh, in the last videos. So uh, there'll be more videos, one video per topic, but each one should be much shorter. So I think overall, the amount of time here should be not much longer than we've had in previous weeks. So we're gonna start by talking about the Logit model broadly. Then we're gonna talk about the choice probabilities that come out of the Logit model. We'll talk about the binary Logit model and the multinomial Logit model as specific examples of, of Logit models. And then we'll talk about how to calculate marginal effects and elasticities the kind of substitution patterns that come out of the Logit model, some of the properties of the Logit model parameters. And we'll talk about calculating uh, counterfactuals and welfare uh, more broadly, but also specifically in the Logit model, and then talk about some empirical considerations. And then there's some slides here for uh, our examples of both a binary and a multinomial Logit model uh, that won't be in the, these videos, but we'll talk about them in class. All of this week's uh, material is based on uh, the chapters 3.1 through 3.6 of the train textbook. So make sure to take a look at that. Uh, I recommend reading that before you watch these videos, but definitely make sure to uh, take a look at it either before or after, preferably before. So the Logit model. Let's start by just recapping the random utility model from last week. The setup of the random utility model is that we have a decision maker choosing the alternative amongst a, a set of discrete alternatives, choosing the alternative that maximizes utility. So to make that a little more formal, the decision maker, we'll call them N, faces a choice among capital J discrete alternatives. Each alternative provides some utility. So we say alternative J provides utility capital U sub NJ to indicate the utility to decision maker N from alternative J. And then N is gonna choose I if and only if the utility from I is greater than the utility from J for all J not equal to I. In other words, just look at the utility from every alternative and pick the one that gives the most. The issue econometrically here is that we, the econometricians do not actually observe utility. We observe the choice that results from utility maximization, but not the utility itself. So we have to model utility as being composed of two components, uh, utility from observed attributes, which we denote capital V, and we call that representative utility, and then utility from unobserved attributes, which we uh, denote as a, an epsilon, and we're gonna treat that as random. And those are just additive. This is a completely general way of just dividing utility into uh, utility from observed and from unobserved attributes. And then the probability that decision maker N chooses alternative I is, uh, we talked through this last time, you know, it's just the probability that, that, that utility from I is greater than J for all J not equal to I. And we worked through some math to show that ultimately it gets us to this you know, multi-dimensional uh, integral where we have to integrate over the joint density of all of the uh, random utility terms for a given decision maker. So what we're gonna do with the Logit model, we're still gonna start from that same setup, but now we're gonna make one additional assumption to get ourselves to kind of a, a simpler uh, expression, a much simpler expression for choice probabilities. And that assumption, which sometimes is gonna be overly strong, but we're gonna start with it here. That assumption is gonna be about the joint density of the unobserved utility, the epsilons for a given decision maker. And what we're gonna assume is that every epsilon, every random draw of unobserved utility is IID, independent and identically distributed, type one extreme value. That's a, that's a kind of distribution, sometimes called the gumbel. And we're gonna assume that it has variance of pi squared divided by six. This might seem like a strange assumption to make and you might be asking, why are we even making this assumption? And we'll see the reason is that it yields a simple closed form expression for choice probabilities. Instead of that multi-dimensional integral that we don't know how to calculate necessarily, we're gonna end up with a really simple expression for choice probabilities. Of course, there are gonna be some downsides here. It's gonna imply some substitution patterns that may, might be unrealistic. And we'll look at those uh, as we get there later in, the, later in these lectures. 
Okay, but first let's dig into this assumption a little bit more. We're assuming that every epsilon is distributed type one extreme value with a certain variance. What is the type one extreme value distribution? What does that even mean? Well, it's kind of like a normal distribution, but with a fatter tail on one side. So the left, uh, the left uh, plot here just shows the probability density of the type one extreme value. So you can see it's not symmetrical, uh, but it kind of has a shape similar to a normal, just with that, that kind of fatter tail on the positive side. And then if we wanna look at the cumulative distribution instead, it's plotted here. Also, you can see once again, kind of similar to the normal CDF, but just with uh, on the positive side, it, it's a little more uh, kind of gradual slope to correspond to that fatter tail. But if you remember back to last week, uh, or, or even that expression for uh, choice probabilities a couple slides ago, at the end of the day, we don't really care about any one draw of epsilon. We care about differences between epsilons, differences between random draws. And so if we were to take two random draws that are both type one extreme value, but independent, and take the difference between them, let's call that epsilon star. Well, epsilon star is a difference between two random variables. It is itself a random variable, and it follows the logistic distribution. And this is actually where the name logit comes from. Logit is just kind of a shortening of logistic. And so the difference between epsilons, which is what we really care about, is distributed logistic or logit. And here I have, once again, the uh, uh, probability density and cumulative distribution of the, the logistic distribution. And you can see these look more, uh, you know, they're symmetric, uh, or, or the, the probability density is symmetric, looks kind of like a normal, uh, or a T or something that we're used to, same with the cumulative distribution. Um, and and the, the actual mathematical expressions for them are here also. So that's the first assumption, or that, that is the assumption we're making about the logit model. Uh, I'll stop there, and in the next video, we're going to talk about what this assumption means for choice probabilities.